Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. Through the mask, we're going we're gonna to try this out. <laughs> Hopefully, the microphone will, will help me be audible. I want to introduce myself for everyone who doesn't know me already. My name is Mary Kay Lambino. I'm the deputy director and Emily Hargroves Fisher, 57, and Richard B. Fisher, curator at the Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center. And first, I just want to thank everyone for being here. This is amazing. I haven't seen this many people in one place in a long time, and we certainly haven't had a chance to have an event like this in quite some time. I think it was probably March 2020. So thanks, everybody. <laughs> And we're here, of course, to celebrate the exhibition Tilled Fields, Drawings by Harry Roseman. So the Loeb actually has been open for the last year. We opened in August, but we just recently returned to our regular hours, our extended hours, too, on Thursday nights. So we're cautiously hosting events. And um, I'm just very pleased to have you all here and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker and kicking off the evening. But before I do, I just want to sort of thank some people and do some introductory comments. The exhibition Tilled Fields is supported by the Evelyn B. Metzger Exhibition Fund and organized by Patricia Fagan, our former curator, the Philip and Lynn Strauss Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Loeb. Patty retired in March and she's here in spirit but in body, she's sitting on her dock in Georgia, thinking about us, I'm sure she would love to be here. And she sends her very best to Harry and to all of his huge fans that I think some of them are here tonight. In addition to Patty, there are numerous individuals who've been instrumental in making this exhibition and it's the exhibition catalog, this publication possible. A little plug, these are available for $20 at our kiosk if you'd like to take one home. Most importantly, I'd like to thank the wonderful Loeb staff, all of whom I've had the pleasure with working, of working with, even through the pandemic, and I'm very grateful for their support that everyone provides in preparing an exhibition. First, I want to thank Bart Thurber for his support for this exhibition, as well as all the resources that went into it. In a pandemic year, it seems like it takes twice the time and work and money to do anything. So it, I'm very grateful for Bart for understanding that and giving the essential support to make this a successful project. For the incredibly hard work and assistance with various aspects of the show, I want to thank Cheryl McMahon, Delaney Caballero, Karen Casey Hines, Eleanor White, Josh Horniff, Elizabeth Nograti, Jess Breyer, Francine Brown, Dominic Canino, Matt Woodward, Peter Daniel, and Kim Squalis. They're the ones who keep the art safe. And of course, the several student assistants who were involved in the making of this exhibition. We were all here for the students after all. Um, and many of them work at the Loeb. In addition to Vassar's, in addition, Vassar's communications department has helped us in so many ways with publicizing this exhibition and producing this catalog. There, I'd like to thank Liz Randolph, Kim Shea, Aidan Gallagher, Tamar Thibodeau, uh, and Dan Leseski. Also, Al Nowak of On Location Studios photographed all of the work for this publication. Um, I hope I didn't forget anything, anyone in terms of our staff. I also want to thank the lenders, some of whom are here this evening, Miriam Gold, Barbara Page, Tom Mirko, Allison Paisley, and of course, Harry and his wonderful wife, Catherine Murphy, also here tonight, um, who I also relied on a little bit to hang the show. She has a wonderful eye, um, but they lent many of the works in the exhibition. And I also want to thank Harry on this occasion, which it's a little after the fact, but this is really his retirement party um, from Vassar where he taught for 40 years. I'll let that one soak in. 40 years. <laughs> Harry was actually the first professor who called me when I arrived here in the early 2000s to show me all the good dining spots near Vassar. Um, and I've since had the pleasure of being photographed by him numerous times at every gathering of the art department and every time I ran into him, Harry was always 
bringing out his camera to take pictures, and you can find these, but I'm not going to tell you the website because I don't want anyone to see all these pictures of me that are out there. Um, but it's pretty easy. It's harryroseman.com. <laughs> um, so Harry invested time, energy, talent to produce all these inspiring works of art that we see in the exhibition. He also served as professor of art since 1981. And he and Peter Charlap really started the studio program and developed it into what it is today with, of course, many additional professors who are here today as well. Um, you know, since the early 2000s, I've had the opportunity to see Harry in action with students, and it's amazingly inspiring. Uh, you know, he's tough, but also just supportive and helpful. And I might say that those grueling crits, some of which that I got to sit in on, really form the basis of any great studio art program. And I got to peek in on some of those, even during the pandemic over Zoom, even more grueling over Zoom, as you can imagine. And it's hard to believe that it was 11 years ago that we worked together in 2010, when Harry created a soaring site-specific installation called Hole in the Wall in the Atrium Gallery at the Loeb that transformed that space into a swirl of line, color, and pattern. So thank you, Harry, for, for all of that and for the exhibition. And now I'm going to introduce our speaker, John Yao. Yao is a poet, art critic, and publisher of Black Square Editions. His most recent poetry book, Genghis Khan on Drums, and his monographs include William Tyler, A Retrospective, 2021, Louis Shandong, also 2021, Philip Taft, 2018, Tom Naskowski, 2017, Catherine Murphy, 2016, and Richard Archwager, Into the Desert in 2015. And that's just the last few years. <laughs> You're a busy guy. In 2017, he was the recipient of the Jackson Prize in Poetry, and in 2021, the recipient of the Rabkin Prize for Art Criticism, an editor of Hyperallergic Weekend and professor of critical studies at Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University. John lives in New York, and it was no easy feat to get him here today with canceled trains and flooded roads, but we're grateful he made it. And also, I want to thank Ben Lucky, who drove, him, drove to New York to pick him up today <laughs> and drove him all the way back. So thank you, Ben. Um, and I just want to leave with this one sort of parting quote, actually, by John about Harry, because I think, you know, when you retire from being a professor, when you're an artist, you don't really ever retire. And it really shows when we look at his new work. So John recently wrote in Hyperallergic, one of the many captivating and delicious things about Roseman's drawings is that Roseman has dissolved the boundary between madness and rationality. He has found another way to keep dancing on a high wire. With that, we can welcome John Yao. Can you hear me? All right, I realized that I wrote this looking at a tiny screen and suddenly it's too small for you to read. So I probably should read it. So you have to make sure I don't back up and fall over. I did that in Berlin in a poetry reading. I fell off the stage. I thought I was part of the act. All right, who's Harry Roseman? <clears throat> Sorry. He's a sculptor of small and large pieces, intimate objects, and public works. He's a draftsman who started a drawing the bolt in 1989 and is still working on it. He's a photographer who's known to take a photograph of everybody he has ever had breakfast, lunch, or dinner with, maybe even snacks. I'm not sure from small gatherings to large groups. He's a portraitist that for more than 40 years has made a series of self-portraits. 
He's a documentarian. He worked as Joseph Cornell's assistant from 1969 to 72 and took photographs that are an essential, that are essential to what we know about the reclusive Cornell. He's a diarist who keeps multiple records or diaries, see all of the above. He's the keeper of a website and he's a longtime teacher, or I guess I have to say now was a longtime teacher. What do these activities have in common? They are conscious ways of addressing one's passage in time. They look towards history and infinity, the present moment, and the vastness in which we exist. All right, that's my talk. No. Um, I, I told myself not to ad lib, but I'm a poet. I can't resist. I'm not the kind of poet that talks a lot between poems, but anyway. Taking a line for a walk was how Paul Clay famously described this artistic process. Oh, wait, let me see. Yeah. <clears throat> Clay's statement also characterizes what Harry Roseman does with line. And yet, as I thought about what I would talk about tonight, I thought Clay's description was one way to characterize this lecture. I'm going to take you on a walk through Roseman's work. I will be your tour guide. I will point things out and make connections, all of which I hope will inspire you to further reflect upon Roseman's art, and more importantly, its implications for everyday life. The walk will not be chronological because, after all, I'm a poet who does not believe in linear narratives because I know there's some truth to how cubism and surrealism evoke reality's brokenness. I'm going to begin the tour with three public sculptures by Roseman. And this is one, Subway Wall, 1990. It was 60 Wall Street. Uh, station. I don't know if you've ever been to Wall Street. Why would you go there? All right. So this is, notice the thing. There's a set of stairs down, and you'll see, and it's on a curved wall. I'm just showing there. It says exit there. So it's a kind of curious mirror, mirror of what you are doing. And this is it. It's all in bronze. It's color, there's a landscape. Uh, the thing that's interesting to me about this landscape is you can't quite tell what season it is. Is it like winter coming, spring? What's happening? It's not like a, a, a pictorial moment. It's more like a transitional moment. Anyway, these are the rocks, all made out of bronze. And they're quite, if you get up close to them, as you see, a lot of hand has been involved in these. Shape the clay, plants, rocks, and that's the wall. So you come in on the right on the escalator, if the escalator's still working, and you walk to your station, all right? Everybody got that? And it seems to me, in all three pieces, starting with this one, that what Harry's working with is a passageway. And a passageway is where you don't really stop to look at anything. You see it out of the corner of your eye, you glance at it, and you walk past. And that really strikes me, because if you think about public sculpture, you think of it as something you go to to look at, and he's doing something different. He's making this moment part of your everyday experience or an everyday experience. It's not a destination, it's something you walk past, right? And the thing is, what do we think about as we go from one place to another? Do we reflect upon these moments, or is the destination all that's important? And the three places that he's done these works, I think, are really part of the meaning. I mean, this is Wall Street. And what does he show you? He shows you what Wall Street was before it became Wall Street, you might say. Oops. That really, it's a land acknowledgement piece 
made before land acknowledgement actually became something we thought about, right? This is what Wall Street was before it became what we know it is now. And I think that's really important because I think he's asking us, how do we live in time? How do we think about time? What does it mean to think we need to get somewhere? Where is there on Wall Street we want to go to? What is, you know, what does destination mean? Okay? And then he picks in, he gets a, a commission for an even more unlikely place. A hallway and a terminal of an airport. Which I have to say, that seems to me like one of the most unfriendly places you can want to put a public sculpture, right? you just gotten off an international flight. You want to get out of the airport. You want to get through the passport control. And that's the place he picked, another passageway where it's really about destination. And I think he kind of heightens your sense of it. And then, and then the other thing to think about is that the curtains, these are made out of a material that contradicts the way we think of curtains, right? So there's a kind of contradiction that's deep in Harry's work. And you're walking along. I don't know how many of you have ever seen this. I actually got really into looking forward to it, which is like not something I usually think is, oh, I really want to go down that hallway. I'm getting off an airplane. It's usually, ugh. Right? And the curtains kind of mimic many things. So that's what it looks like. You can see all the people are looking at it, right? They're just going crazy. <laughs> you know, because who stops to look at art in a hallway in a terminal? And I think that's so amazing that Harry did this. Because it's really like a kind of beautiful gesture and a kind of acknowledgement of the absurdity of it, and also kind of generous, and it mimics our behavior, because if you know the curtains, you know that they start off still, and they start to move, and curtains, what are curtains? Like in a stage, they part to open up and show you something, right? Or they block a window, or because they're white on blue, they mimic the clouds, which are always changing. How many of you think about this when you're walking down the hallway in an airport? But actually, you should be thinking about things like that, right? What's life if it's not the ability to think about something that you're experiencing rather than thinking about where you're trying to get to or what you're trying to get away from, right? And I think that's one of the basic issues that Harry's work has always dealt with. Like, what does it mean to be human in this moment, stuck in time? Because we're all, we're all, the one thing that makes us all have what we have is we're all caught in time, right? And how often do we want to think about that? All right, so that's one of his preoccupations. And it reminds me of a line that uh, Dylan Thomas wrote it's the first line of one of his poems. The poem is, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower drives my green age. That blasts the roots of trees is my destroyer. Right? That as time passes, we're just approaching the end. How do we live in that, with that awareness? And as the cliff notes from this poem are likely to read, and they're not wrong, life and death, growth and decay are inseparable. Okay, so we descend or ascend the escalator before arriving at the subway platform or reaching the street. We pass the curving wall, a landscape of rocks and trees made of bronze. There's a set of stairs on the walls released far right evoking your ascent or descent as it mirrors what you did or are about to do. 
I think of subway walls an early piece of, as, as I said, land acknowledgement. Was this, what was this landscape above? What did it look like before now? Whatever this now is. And really, it reminds you that Wall Street, whatever you think of it, is not permanent, right? So I think that's also really something about Harry's work. Oh, I love this part. It's on the part of the, when you're leaving or entering this ascent, you just think, why did they tilt this? And then the curtains kind of mimic it. And then there's this piece in Vassar. And if you think about it, and this is true of many buildings all over, one thing that architects don't really think about sometimes is the elevator and the staircase. They really think about the room. The hallway is like, how many hallways in schools, prisons, or hospitals are interesting, right? It's just something you're passing through. And here, all the lines are about ascension or verticality, and they're echoed by the posts on the right, which echo the railing and the posts there. There's something quite beautiful and kind of mesmerizing about this piece. Most of the, you know, when I'm at Rutgers waiting to take the elevator, I'm not usually thinking about, oh, this elevator door is something interesting to look at. Especially now since it says only two people are allowed on an elevator at a time. Please take the stairs. And this, the line, here's Harry working with the line again. <coughs> Sorry. All right, so 1989, around the time he's working on the cloud, I mean on the subway, he started this drawing. What does it mean to begin a drawing of a weave pattern on a bolt of cloth that is yards and yards long? an endless drawing that you will one day no longer be able to work on, right? What does it mean to start a project like that? And here's Harry, and I'm gonna have him talk because he's so much more eloquent than I am. I'm not gonna have him, he's not gonna talk for all 10 minutes. But there he is with okay. his camera. Um. Well, I'm going to have to have you move over that way slightly, just because the camera's blocking your face. Oh, that's that's good. Yeah. And this is Bryce Daniel, who's the filmmaker. Oh, good. Made you smile too. Okay. You all saw the drawing out there. I didn't know it was going to be in the show. That's one of his So blinds. this is the studio that I had built around 1990. And before that, when we first got the house, um, Catherine and I used two bedrooms in the house for studios, and they were pretty small. And then I did a very large subway project, a public project, which gave me the money to do this, to convert this space. And that was around 90. And I made some decisions in designing it that were aesthetic and maybe not practical, because it's a very high ceiling. And I had to decide between having two complete floors, which would have given me more floor space and maybe more wall space, or keeping this high space. So as you can see, I kept the high space. The last five, six years I've been working on these plywood sculptures, which are called folded plywood. These I only did last year, which are much smaller. They're not conceptually totally related to the bolt, which we'll talk about after. But the process, like the bolt, is a little Sisyphusian. So four right. by eight drawing, zero brush, that's what I wanted to talk about. 
He uses the word Sisyphean, as in the myth of Sisyphus, right? And think about the artist becoming Sisyphus, right? The, you know, the story of Sisyphus is pretty simple, and it, we mo mostly know it through the myth of Sisyphus, an essay written by Albert Camus in uh, 1940. He starts it. It's published in 1942. And uh, in the essay, Camus introduces the notion of the absurd. For Camus, the absurd is that space between the essential human desire to attribute meaning to life and the material universe's complete indifference to us. What Camus called the unreasonable silence. According to Camus, this silence requires revolt. He then goes on to use the myth of Sisyphus to frame human actions. In the myth, Sisyphus pushes a boulder up a mountain only to have it rolled down again. He's doomed to repeat this meaningless task. Camus concludes his essay with this sentence. The struggle itself is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. And that made me think of Harry when he used this word as a happy Sisyphus, which I had never thought of till I watched this film and thought about this drawing. That when I first read Sis uh, the myth of Sisyphus at 16 or 17 and fell in love with the despair of existentialism I did not think of Sisyphus as a happy character. But in a sense, that's what Harry's done. He's made Sisyphus, he's a happy Sisyphus. I'm sure he's not going to agree with this later tonight. He'll probably pour poison in my drink. So what does it mean to make a drawing of a weaving pattern that mirrors in greater scale and detail the very thing you're drawing, right? that basically the drawing is a magnified version of the thing he's drawing on, which is kind of deliciously absurd and intellectually brilliant. Okay, so here it is. And the, also the idea to start something that you know you're not gonna finish. That all of the world tells you that you're supposed to be productive you're supposed to make something. You're supposed to be, you've got to make something out of yourself. Who has not heard that phrase? And he's not dealing with that. That's not the world he's gonna evoke. And it's really a kind of act of madness, passion, and devotion all at once. All right? So in 2007, uh, I interviewed Harry for the Brooklyn Rail, and he was having a show that he titled 100 Most Popular Colors. And uh, it's, it, it's based on a chart that you buy in a hardware store that has 100 colors on it, starting, I think, with blush white and ending with violet, so you can decide what room you room should be, what room you want to paint, what color you want to paint your room. And he decides to work on a hundred of them. And it reminded me of something Jasper John said uh, when he wrote in a sketchbook, take an object, do something to it, do something else to it, repeat. So this is the first one. You can see the color chart. Actually, when I saw the color chart, I thought, God, suppose you don't want your room any of these colors. Then what? So the thing I think that really got me about this was to, if you pick a hundred or something and you say you're gonna work on it, at a certain point, it's beyond what you already know how to do, right? that basically you're making a project where all the tricks that you have as an artist, you're gonna run out. And then what do you do? 
And I think that's one of the challenges of, that Harry presents to himself. How do I get beyond what I know how to do to make something? So this is one. Whoops. Oh. And this is what he says in the interview. There's a performative, a this is me, there's a performative aspect to some drawings, such as when you make a perfect physical circle with a drop of paint. Right, they're not flat and drawn. They're physical blobs of paint, which you have to think about when we get to the last group of works. So a as much as Harry's work is different in different consistent bodies, they also have a lot of connections. All right, and then he goes, my process and my ideas about much of my work seems to me to be incremental. I'm very interested in things that build up by mark or dab, and sometimes you see it, and sometimes you don't. When the circle drops, it's apparent, okay? And then he goes on, and then he said, when I realized that I could cut and peel the color samples, it opened up a lot of possibilities. So he didn't know what he was going to do when he started. He just knew that he was going to do it. So then he does different things. Or this one, which I really love. It's like, I'm going to do three different things or more. And they'll all sort of, so if the first one oops, seems connected, right? All right, they're all lines. They're all at an angle. None really seems vertical or horizontal. There's some of that, but not. And then he does that. OK, I'm going to move the color charts around. What's the logic in that? There is. You feel like there's a logic, but there's not an obvious logic. And I think that's the other thing about Harry's work, whereas in the bolt, you feel like he always has to be a weave. There's going to be shifts and changes in color. There's going to be surprises. But in this work, there's like big surprises. And also like a kind of commentary on sign. Like uh, I was looking at all those signs, like the thing about smoking, this and that. And I thought, how many signs do we live in the, with that we memorize? that we carry around with us, that's a kind of visual language that we, you know. And then this one, let's just get rid of all the color charts and leave one. Or this one, solid all wit, eat your heart out. I really love this piece. There's an, and, and actually, Christian Boltansky I thought of Christian Boltansky and Harry because Christian Boltansky early on made a piece where he rolled uh, bread into, a he wanted to roll it to 100 perfect round balls. And he said he wanted it so the viewer didn't know if the artist was deliberate or crazy. And I thought, well, that's really delicious. I wish my students would look at me that way, but. I think they just think the latter. All right, two still lives. I don't really, I don't, I have to say, there's a period of Harry's work that I feel like is underknown. I mean, he's underknown as far as I would claim, but this part. And so I'm going to show two still lives. They're kind of release. This one, which seems to me, it hints at a real disorder to whoever lives this way. Look at the lampshade. It's not, seems wrong. And look at the angle of the uh, dresser and the TV, and it's all crammed on. So one of the things about Harry's work is, on one hand, it looks really straightforward. Then you look at it longer, and you start to see more and more into it. And that seems to me contrary to what happened in a lot of art in the, in the 70s, 60s, when Frank Stull said, what you see is what you see, and Warhol said, don't look beyond the surface. That you're supposed to get it all at once. And in a way, 
Grossman's work seems to go against that kind of consumption, right? That notion that you get it all at once is a kind of consumption. It fits in with the capitalist system. And there's a kind of, I would say, beautiful bleakness to this work, you know? And then when he does that, two years later, he does this. Now, everything in this, it's two-thirds real size. He made it out of plasticine clay, had it cast in plaster, painted everything, including the shadows under the thumbtacks, as he was clear to point out to me. And then think about this perfect world that's two-thirds human size. And think about the artist as being a kind of God figure, omnipotent, I can make this, I can make that. And then by making it two-thirds size, he's like cut himself down to size, so to speak. He's undermined that omnipotence, which I think many artists don't really want to do. How do you undermine yourself? I made this, how can I undermine it? And there's a kind of uh, homeliness to it, right? It's just a part of the studio wall. It's nothing exalted. There's your Elmer's glue. There's all the things you need. And there's different memories, different important things, the staircase. This kind of, as every artist I know has a wall somewhere that they put postcards on. Right? It's kind of touchstones for their life. It's just like poets keep notebooks where they write lines down from other people's poems. Right? It's a way of kind of internalizing it. And there's the, can you know, there's the film. I mean, this is an amazing piece. It's, and it and it's, was done in 73 and it's not famous. That tells you about the world. The thing that cannot be folded is folded. The thing that is hanging loose is suggested to be solid. There's a kind of whimsical side to Harry that's also completely serious, as in this. And you can think of a lot of planar sculpture that was spread out across the wall that took itself very seriously. And then Harry comes along. And he says, yes, you can be completely serious and whimsical and do something amazing. Because we know plywood can't be folded, right? You're kind of going to stare at it and go, wait a second. And we know it can be done this way, but what does that mean? And then you're staring at plywood. I mean, when's the last time you stared at plywood, right? So what is it that you look at and why do you look at it? I mean, do you only want to look at Damien Hirst's skull because it's covered with diamonds? Is that really an art experience? Or this? I mean, I, I really think this is kind of a, one of the things I think Harry's done, though he's never said this to me, is he's also commented on art that's been made and taken seriously in a way that he kind of undermines that seriousness, even as he pays homage to it. I should have shown more of these. Or this delicious piece, a linen napkin made out of fired clay, you know, a napkin being a piece of cloth, a painting is a piece of cloth. It's a minimalist painting with a scalloped edge. It's all sorts of things. It, one of the things I think about Harry's work is it opens up ways of looking at art, thinking about things you use, napkins, domesticity, craft, painting, it all gets kind of put together, and how do we take it apart? Should we even think about taking it apart? Why should we separate activities into certain levels of importance and dismiss other level things, right? 
And just the color, I mean, also just that he chose raspberries and cream, I, you know. It is this funny, interesting color. John actually once said about a Bryce Martin monochrome painting, it's so delicious it want to lick it. And that, those words came to me when I was looking at this work, or this beautiful piece. It's so kind of tender and subtle, right? Monochromatic painting takes itself deadly serious. And here he's added another level of way to look at it. Or this one, which is probably my favorite. Can I say that? Whereas he's like made plywood into this thing that's hanging there. Again, it's this, one of the great things is the contradiction in Harry's work that makes you not just look at it, but think about it. And I think really that's important. How and what does it mean to make one thing into another and yet still honor the thing, right? So then, he says, my process, I go back to this scene to be incremental. And then, these works. So at one point, and I'm not sure the exact circumstances of it, is that Harry asked me to see his work or I wanted to know what he was up to, because every now and then I think it's good to go visit an artist studio. And he showed me these drawings and it's like accident and decision. He pours the paint when I was looking at this on the screen, it might have been because it was one in the morning, I started to think of alien hands in a science fiction movie. Anyway, and then he draws a line around it, and then another and another, and it's an act of meditation, not unlike the bolt. So how do you live in time, right? If you're an artist, you're making something. It requires that you spend time doing it. Why do you do it? What does it mean? And here he is, he's really just talking about, or not talking about, he's physically addressing the notion of time passing. It's like, he's like counting tree rings, right? And then this so something amazing and beautiful happens that he follows each line and makes sure that he doesn't do certain things. And then at the same time, accidents might happen and he has to incorporate them into his work. And he never does the same thing twice, even though he does the same thing over and over. Right, isn't that kind of amazing? Right, it's Heraclitus. You can't step in the same river twice. How many of us kind of acknowledge that experience? A friend of mine, a Chinese artist, reminded me, oddly, Yu Shaodong, he said his father used to smoke. He, his father smoked a lot. Uh, and he, his son, and he worked in a paper mill in northern China, I think made something would be the equivalent of about $8 a month. And he had never complained. He just worked, supported his family. What I really love about this is, in a way, he just pours this black down and then he like devotes himself to making an outline around each one. And you feel like, but then he does something interesting. Like if you look over in the left-hand corner below the one, there's one that's not got anything in it. So then you go, wait a second. Did he only do it around something, or why is that there, right? You see the one I'm talking about? Nod your heads, please. Yeah, okay, and I think th those decisions where you don't know why he did it, but you believe that he, there was a reason or there's a kind of meaning to it, 
I think is also part of the meaning of the work and what makes it really interesting that something doesn't have to add up because really life doesn't add up, right? It's not like it all fits together and adds up. That only happens in bad novels. And the thing that strikes me also about Harry, and this is sort of the last thing I want to say, is that there's realism and there's reality. And realism's the kind of style, and Harry's really interested in reality, which gets beyond style. How do you deal with reality? Realism's a way to approach the world and kind of make it safe for yourself. As if you read a lot of realist novels, some are really good, some are not so good. Real, reality is something else. It, may, it requires different responses, different situations, different solutions. And as I don't think of Harry's art as a solution. I think of it as a kind of ongoing exploration. And I would like to leave it at that. Thank you. Was there supposed to, just uh, I thought you all had little candles. Uh, if you want to ask me a question, I'll, I'll try and answer you. I thought we should at least have that possibility. Yep, and I have a mic that I can bring to whoever has a question. I heard someone yelp. Was that a question or a yelp? No questions. Wow. Is that a good sign or a bad sign? We've got a question. <laughs> ah, I knew Buzz would ask me a question. He's going to ask me in Russian, so I can't answer him. Hi, Buzz. <laughs> Hi, John. I, I, I was so struck by your reading of the studio still life and its scale as a kind of almost self-deprecating choice by the artist. And it, it, it makes me, it, it helped me to understand better than I had before how all the work that, of Harry's that I've seen over the years uh, finds uh, slight incongruities of scale, not simply process. Right. And I was wondering if you could comment on the notion of incongruous scale. Yeah, I mean, there is a kind of, It's not miniature, it's not life-size. It's sort of this in-between. Miniature, you feel like the person's in control, life-size, but somewhere in-between kind of unsettles you because how do you inhabit that space? And in a way, you can't. And I think that's really kind of about, say, the indifference of the world, that you can't inhabit it. And there's, and yet it's, the studio still life is like the artist studios where he or she is probably most comfortable and spends a huge amount of time. And in a way, his studio thing, as much as it's all about things you can use, closes you out just enough and pulls you in just enough to leave you in this kind of uneasy thing, which I find really delicious. And also unsettling in a, a nice way, you know, and it gives you a way to reflect on it. I don't know if that makes sense. Right, exactly. So any, any other questions? Thank you for that question. Got me to think further on this. Always a good thing to think further. Okay, I'll go think further by myself. Thank <laughs> you.